O Lord, you are from everlasting. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. May your word reign in our hearts, now and forever. Amen. One of the TV shows, fewer and fewer these days, I have to say, which I never miss, is Only Connect. If you're not familiar with the format, round one provides the contestants with four apparently random clues, and they have to work out the connection between them. Well, I have such a puzzle for you now. Here are the four. Children in need. Shoeboxes. Protests in Rotterdam. Christ the King. Often, as in this case, the final item contains the most obvious clue. And if you've taken more than a passing glance at our lectionary readings today, you will have picked up all the various references to kingship in one form or another. And of course, today we celebrate Christ the King. And I guess the connection then is today, or maybe more accurately, this weekend. Before I come back to those other clues, you may be wondering why. Why do we celebrate Christ the King now? Wasn't the Ascension back in May? And I know it took the UK over a year to organise our Queen's coronation back in the 1950s. But you might think they could do things rather more quickly in heaven. Well, the church's calendar each year follows roughly the life cycle of messiahship, prophecy, annunciation, birth, ministry, passion, resurrection, ascension. At this time of year, as we approach Advent, we approach the beginning of a new cycle. So it seems appropriate that we should sum up the previous cycle in that final image of Christ in glory, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Some of us have just finished a study course based on Sam Wells' book, The Heart of It All. And the book seeks to encapsulate the core elements of the Bible narrative in just under 100 pages. It's no mean task. One of the elements which Wells includes is the desire of the people of Israel for a king. In the early days of the nation, after they'd crossed over the River Jordan into the Promised Land, they were governed by judges, not judicial authorities in the sense that we now use, but more like civil or religious arbiters, certainly not all powerful monarchs. And they feel in this that they are at a disadvantage compared with the other nations around them. These have warrior kings. These covet their prosperity. So they approach Judge Samuel and demand a king. And Samuel warns them what the consequences will be of having such a king. He will take their sons as soldiers. He will take their daughters to work the land and as concubines. He will tax their wealth, their crops, their cattle, their slaves. And he will do all things as he pleases. But the people are unmoved. We are determined to have a king over us. And at God's command, Samuel gives in to their demand. Now most of us know something of the story of King Saul. At first things go well, but Saul's mental health suffers. He turns away from God, and the people turn away from him. David is chosen to rule after him. And after a brief skirmish with a rather large Philistine, David becomes king. And so begins a golden age for Israel, 
an age to which in generations to come people will look back with envy, an age which they believed the promised Messiah would one day restore. And in this lies our second connection, because while most societies like the people of Israel welcome the authority exercised by their ruler, as long as they see it as being to their advantage, there is a line which once crossed will cause people to withdraw their consent, much as we are seeing in the news from the streets of Rotterdam at the moment. But back to King David and to the Messiah. I've already said that a charismatic warrior king who would lead them and throw out the occupying Romans was what the people of Jesus' time were looking for in their Messiah. So what did they get? My kingdom is not of this world. So says Jesus to Pilate, for I was born and for this I come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Not the type of kingship I think that Pilate would ever understand or indeed the Jewish authorities of Jesus' day. But the common people, the people on the margins, the poor, the hungry, those who weep, those who are hated or excluded or reviled or defamed. You'll find the list in Luke's account of the Beatitudes. I think we get a better picture of Jesus' form of kingship from another passage, though, towards the end of Matthew's Gospel. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? And so on. And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of those who are members of my family, you did it to me. And so we come back to the first of two, two clues that I gave you. Children in need and the shoeboxes which some of us have been filling to be sent as a Christmas gift to impoverished children around the world. Because if we listen to the words spoken by Jesus rather than about him, those children in our own society and around the world are surely the first subjects in his kingdom. And if we wish to join them there, remember his words. Truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it for me. I think that is the sort of king which we should be demanding. O Lord, you are everlasting. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. May your word reign in our hearts, now and forever. Amen.